Should have been an easy score. Rob an old man, leave without much fuss. We never could have guessed how south it would go. Everyone had heard of Duncan Adams. He'd been a fixture in the community for generations, living in that wild old house up on Mount Yaller. He'd been a writer, a professor of antiquities at Georgia State College, and any number of other things. His house was supposed to contain all sorts of expensive things, and we were going to see if the rumors were true. Mike didn't like it, though. Guy like that is certain to have all sorts of security, the best measures money can buy, and you just expect the four of us to walk in like it's nothing. Julius, Gavin, Mike, and I like to call ourselves a crew, but that was just from watching too many heist movies. In reality, we were just four guys who like to break into people's houses and steal things. We weren't druggies, we, we weren't criminals, despite what our records said, but we did like to buy nice things, and stealing often paid for them better than a real job. You'd think so, I said, but my brother went up there to do a job and said that there were no security systems, no cameras, no nothing. The dude is just asking to get robbed, and I say we take him up on it. My youngest brother's a plumber, and that was actually where I got the idea for the job. He got called about a month ago to fix some pipes in the old man's bathroom and came back to tell us how cool the place was. He had all these mirrors on the grounds and in the house and on the walls and it was like a fun house. It was really cool looking, he said. The old man had paid him a mint to do the job and I'd spent the next three weeks thinking about that house and planning the biggest heist that I could imagine plan is that we go in just after dark and jump the sidewall. We can go in through the garden out back and come out on the back porch and into the house. The old man's a hard sleeper. My brother said he had to ring the bell a dozen times before he woke up. We can go in and out before he ever even knows we're there and live like fat rats off the spoils. Mike still wasn't sure, but Greed was slowly eroding his sense of self-preservation. He said he would bring it to a vote with the rest of the crew and later that afternoon, he called to say that the vote had been carried unanimously. The other two were in, and Mike wasn't about to hold us up with some tickling feeling of doubt. Hope your intel's right, because if you're not, we're all going to be royally screwed. And that was how we came to be hunkered in the scrub around the Duncan Adams estate, waiting for it to get good and dark. We were all dressed in dark clothes. Jules and Gavin wearing ski masks while Mike and I just had our hoods pulled up. I was pretty sure that we wouldn't need cover, but Jules had two prior arrests and Gavin was clean for the moment. Both wanted to stay out of prison, if they could help it, and had opted to cover their faces. As the dark began to settle around us, we kept to the fence and prepared to vault over. It was just a simple concrete wall, no lights or cameras on the top. But Mike stopped before making a stirrup with his hands to point at a sign on the wall. You didn't say nothing about a dog. I looked at the sign, wrinkled my brow as I tried to remember if Lewis had mentioned a dog. He hadn't. He'd said nothing about any kind of animals on the property. But a dog could complicate things. The sign was the usual black and yellow one that bore the legend, Beware of Dog, on it. But it looked a little faded, and I suddenly wondered if it was something from a while ago. It's probably old. Lewis didn't say anything about a dog or a cat or anything to do with animals. Mike seemed unsure, but I doubled down. Tell you what, I'll go first and drop behind the gate. If there's a dog, it'll just tear me up, and I'll find some way to get out, or you guys can run. We'll only be out for the gas it took to get us here and I'll have spent a night in jail, worst case scenario. Mike still looked unsure, but he made a stirrup with his hands, and I vaulted over the wall and landed in a well-kept backyard. It had been landscaped to look oriental, maybe Japanese or something, and there was a bridge over a little creek and a well-cared-for walkway that led to the back of the house. There was a sand pit with rocks in it, some trees cut to resemble bonsai trees, and several large reflective columns interspaced around. It was definitely different, but I liked it the longer I stood waiting to get mauled by a Rottweiler or a pit bull. What do you see? 
Mike whispered as I scanned the area for a slobbering beast that was just waiting to strike. Nothing. Well, not nothing, but no dog. Come on over. I think it's safe. They dropped over one at a time, Mike reaching back to pull Gavin over before landing himself. They all stared at the strange little garden, so alien in the twilight, and when no lights came on to mark them and no dog came out to chase us away, we all sighed collectively. Looks like there wasn't a dog after all, Julia said. Or he's inside, Mike said skeptically. Whatever, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. We gotta get inside first, I reminded them as we set off across the little garden path. It was a little eerie to walk across the shadowy garden with only the moon to guide us. The place seemed to be made of strange angles and the reflective monoliths didn't help matters much. They were everywhere, a new one jutting up every seven or eight feet and they played strange games in the moonlight. I would catch myself looking at them out of the corner of my eye and more than once I had to turn and make sure something wasn't following us. The reflections created strange shadows and I was sure I saw something dart out of sight before turning to find nothing and nowhere that it could have gone. These things are weird, Julia said, keeping his voice pitched low. I could swear I keep seeing something in them, but it's gone when I look. Me too, Gavin said, sounding a little unnerved. Eyes on the prize, boys, I reminded them. But I didn't sound as sure as I tried to convey. The backyard hadn't looked very big, but as we moved towards the house, it seemed to go on forever. We were staying low, trying not to draw attention to ourselves, but it seemed like we should have been there by now. Whenever I looked at the back porch, it always seemed to be about 50 feet away, and every step seemed to bring us no closer. What the hell was that? Gavin asked, and his voice was too high. Julia shushed him, whispering back, What are you talking about? There it was again, right there, I, I saw it, Gavin said, pointing at one of the polished monoliths. I glanced at it, but it was just a flat reflection of the weird trees sitting on the back wall. There's nothing there, Gav. Get it together, man. In a few hours, we'll be leaving with more loot than we can carry. Then you can freak out if you still want to. Gavin looked unsure, but he nodded and kept pace as we made our way through the collection of old trees and topiaries. He wasn't the only one getting a little nervous, though. I could see something in those reflections, too. Something I was beginning to think might be our dog. It was big way too big to go vanishing like it always seemed to. It was a mastiff or a wolf hybrid or something, and the longer we trekked through the garden, the closer it seemed to get to us. At first it was just curiously observing us, seeing what we were doing and enjoying its little game of startling us. As we neared the house, though, the game changed. Now it was getting closer to our group, weaving between the statues and plants, getting bigger as it stalked us. I still wasn't sure how it was doing that. The thing had to be nearly five feet tall on all fours, but it would disappear any time I turned to look behind me. I wondered if there was some sort of electrical gadget in these things, maybe a display mount to scare intruders, but when I looked right at the polished mirror front, I saw nothing but my own reflection and the larger-than-usual bonsai topiary behind me. I'd like to tell you that we made it to the house before things went sideways, but that's not true. Truth was, we never even saw the inside of the house. We came within about ten feet of the back porch, a trip that seemed to take longer than it should have when the purpose of the monoliths became apparent. We were hunched around some of the oddities of the garden, trying to get our nerve up before heading in. Gavin and I weren't the only ones that had been seeing things out of the corner of our eyes, and nerves were high as the goal came into view. Now the real work would begin, but we weren't sure what to expect from this funhouse garden. Would we be allowed to make it to the house? Would we be mowed down by some huge hound on our way to the porch? I didn't know, but suddenly this didn't seem like the easy score I had promised them. Jules, I whispered. 
go see if the back door is unlocked. Why have I got to do it? Jules asked, his nerves jangling a little. Because you're the closest to the door. Just get up there and see. Jules looked at the house like it was the absolute last place he wanted to go. But greed still had its teeth in him. We could still make something of this. Still come out okay. And he scampered up the porch steps with all the stealth he could muster. The doors were glass, fronting on a huge glassed-in kitchen. And when Jules reached out for the handle, he seemed as shocked as we were when it pulled down easily. Damn, guy is not even... But as he took his eyes off the glass, I saw something loom up behind him. Something that made me tremble. It was the dog. A huge black hellhound with a gaping maw full of sharp teeth and piercing red eyes. It was behind the glass, and I thought for sure that it would jump through and bury Jules with its bulk. I started to yell, started to warn him, but when it leaned out of the glass and snapped its teeth around him, I was surprised by the lack of a crash. Jules looked surprised too, his shock absolute, and when the creature yanked him into the glass and out of sight, we were left in stunned silence with only the crickets for company. What the hell was that? Gavin said, his voice trembling audibly. I don't know, Mike said, his voice inches behind me as he inched away with every breath. But I'm not sticking around to find out. He was off and running then, tearing back towards the wall we'd come over. He looked scared enough to jump it without any help, and when I called for him to stop, I winced as a light came on in the house. Great, we'd woken up the old man. Gavin saw the light and took a few steps back himself, but when Mike screamed suddenly, Gavin and I froze as we turned back to see what had happened. In the fleeting rays of the porch light, I saw Mike caught beneath the massive paws. It was coming from the surface of a polished square, and as the head emerged, the beast looked as big as a grizzly bear. The fur was wiry and stiff, something I believe they called brindled in the dog world, and its muzzle was already dripping with blood. It bent down over Mike, the poor guy screaming and thrashing as much as his smushed lungs would allow, and when it covered his head with its mouth, the crying and yelling was cut off abruptly. It took Mike's head with it, but was nice enough to leave the body behind as it disappeared into the polished surface of the brooding rectangle. Gavin and I just stood there for a minute, unsure of what to do. When the door to the back porch opened, we both got low as we tried to hide from whoever had come to check on the ruckus. "'Who's there?' said a voice that had probably once been a little more impressive. Age had done it no favors, and now it was a little less impressive, a little less commanding, but the owner seemed to know that he wasn't the most dangerous creature in the garden. The sound of a cane thumping on the boards could be heard, and when he saw the body, he croaked out a rough laugh. Decided to come and steal from an old man, huh? You didn't think you were the first, did you? I looked at Gavin as we hid, trying to tell him to be still, though he seemed to be losing that particular fight. More than a few people have thought that they could come and plunder what I've rightfully taken in my prime. They see an old man living alone and think to make his home their find of the century. They never guess that the most dangerous thing here might be my own biggest find. As we watched, the old man put out a hand, and the hellish beast stuck its nose out of the window it had sucked jewels into, so the old man could scratch it like any other dog. I was excavating a tomb in Russia when I found them. These strange black monoliths were just in a cave towards the back of the old tomb. I had never seen anything like them or the beast they held, but it had enough intelligence to understand me when I made it an offer. It didn't seem to be enough that he was going to kill us. 
the old codger meant to monologue before his hell beast devoured us. Come back to my home, I said. Come into the lighted world again, and I will take you from this place and let you hunt my enemies for me. And so I have. It has hunted a long time on would-be thieves and robbers and eaten well in the process. You will be no different. Gavin looked at the back wall, a path that would take him over the unmoving corpse of Mike and seemed to be trying to decide if it was worth the risk. I shook my head at him, trying to tell him not to, but when he suddenly sprinted across the lawn, I found myself right behind him. I could no more stop myself from fleeing in my terror than he could, and we dodged around the monoliths at every opportunity. The hound lunged at us nonetheless, coming out of either side as it tried to stop us. We were neck and neck, nearly to the wall, when Gavin suddenly tripped. I looked back and found that Gavin's foot was stuck in a trap too devilish to escape. The creature had him by the ankle, and as it dragged him backwards, I sprinted for the wall and leapt at the top. My fingers burned as they tried to dig into the concrete, and I'm not ashamed to say that I left a few fingernails behind as I scrambled over the top. I drove home, expecting that the creature or the police would come after me every mile of the way. When it didn't come lunging out of my rearview mirror and no blue and whites dogged my heels, I breathed a sigh of relief. I drove home, locked all the doors in my trailer, and went to my room so I could write this down while it's still fresh. Now that I have, I'm not sure what to do. Do I call the police? What would I even tell them? Can that thing get me through my own mirror? My computer monitor? The surface of my spoons? I don't know what to do. But I do know one thing. If you ever hear of Duncan Adams and his strange house in the mountains and think that an old man living alone will be an easy score, think again. The dog that he has can't be bribed with treats and pets. And all you'll have from that place is death for you and anyone who comes along with you. I don't know what I'm going to do. They won't stop pounding on the door. They won't stop calling my name. And before long, someone with keys is going to come along and unlock my office. I don't know what to do. I'm completely out of my element here. And all my brain can come back to is that coffee. The coffee. The goddamn coffee. First cup of the morning, he'd asked. And all I could do was smile at him. He must be new because if he'd been here longer than a week, he'd know how often I show up to this machine. I stood before the coffee pot like a worshiper at the altar, and as the savory black liquid spilled into the pot, I felt my mouth water at the thought of coffee. First cup. Yeah, right. I started my day with the taste of warm, fresh brewed coffee. As I'd cooked my breakfast, I'd had another, savoring this one a little, as I never did the first cup. And as I sat down to catch up on my emails, I drank a third as I ate my breakfast. I'd add another one on the way to work, savoring the aroma as I sat in traffic, and now it was time to get a cup before I sat down for another day of work. First cup. Try fifth. I've been like this since my late teens. My mother was a career nurse who drank coffee by the pot, not the cup. As a single mother trying to keep up with an active son, there was never a time I can't remember when coffee was a part of our lives. When I was just a tyke, my mom was always running late, due to my inability to get moving in the morning. No one wants to lose their job because their kid can't get ready on time, so one morning, she gave me a sippy cup of coffee, sweetened with milk and sugar. No surprise, I took to it like a fish to water. The other parents looked at her funny when she told them. She heard the usual sermons about how coffee would stunt my growth and make me hyper, but she always felt she knew better. The fact that I was never prone to hyperactivity and grew to the top out about six feet, seemed to have proven their worries were groundless. Coffee is life for me. It runs through my veins, and I always joke that when I die, I'm going to donate my body to Starbucks I can be their flavor of the month. That cup looks a little rough, don't you think? I turned to see Chuck wander into the break room then, unrecognizable health smoothie in his My Body is a Temple shaker cup. 
The new guy greeted him as he came in, and I extended my hand for a fist bump. As he met my knuckles with his, I couldn't help but shudder a little at how scaly and clammy his skin always is. You'd think with all that rabbit food he ate, those healthy shakes would make his skin a little softer, or at least clear up his skin condition. It's got character, Chuck, unlike whatever you're drinking there. Chuck laughed. If character is what you call mushrooms growing in the bottom of that thing. He was right. Not about the mushrooms, but about the state of my cup. I'd had this cup for three years, and in that time, I had never once bothered to wash it. The outside was a little stained up, but otherwise looked pretty normal. The inside, however, was a dark cauldron of old coffee stains and filth. It didn't look that bad to me, but of course, I had gotten used to it by now. I always justified it by telling myself that I was putting boiling water into it, so anything living in there was likely to get boiled out of existence by the time I got around to drinking the coffee. I had no idea what I was setting myself up for. The hot liquid splashed into the cup with a luxuriant sound. I swirled the contents around in the cup before taking a test sip and gasping in pain. It was much too hot, but I had known that already. I talked with Chuck a few more minutes, and when Mr. Ryan strode into the break room, we all said our goodbyes and left for our desk. Mr. Ryan's was a fantastic boss, but he had a very narrow opinion on dawdling and socializing on company time. I said hi to a few other people in my hall and stopped at Rob's door to pass a few words. He was hard at it already, and I could see his tongue sticking out through his teeth, a nervous habit he said he'd had since elementary school. His dark hair looked sweaty, and when I asked him if he was okay, he said he had to make an 8 o'clock deadline, but maybe he could catch up at lunch. I said that sounded great, and as I walked to my office, I saw that Lisa was already behind her computer as well. Lisa was a mousy new girl that had moved into the office across from mine a few months ago. She was about my age, with straight brown hair that she always piled neatly on her head, and she had a cute pair of black glasses that were constantly needing to be pushed up the bridge of her nose. She didn't say much, but we waved at each other most mornings, and I'd be lying if I said I didn't have just a little bit of a crush on her. She waved back, smiling in her shy way, and went back to work as I stepped into my office and closed the door. I sat the coffee on my desk and turned on my computer as I prepared to start another day. I'm an IT specialist, so my job is mostly fixing other people's problems. There was an email already from Janice about how her monitor wouldn't come on, and another from Steven about how his issues with the network had gotten out of hand again. I sipped my coffee as I read these, testing the hot liquid with my lips before committing to the sip. I reached for the phone so I could call Janice. Janice was a frequent caller. The IT guy before me had thought it was funny to give her the most ancient of our relic computers. I'd been keeping that dinosaur running for years now, and every time the budget committee told me they didn't have enough money for a new computer, I died a little inside. I called Steven, and after a few questions, it became apparent that his problem was of his own making again. He'd open another questionable email, and now his computer wouldn't link to the network. That was by design. Steven was notorious for opening anything that found its way into his inbox. He'd brought the network down several times with this sort of behavior, and I logged in remotely to revert it to a previous state, which solved the problem. The virus hadn't been that aggressive, it seemed, and he thanked me for helping him. I reached for my cup and found that it was empty. I'd been sipping the coffee while I was on the phone with Steven, and I'd drank more than expected, I guess. I called Janice and asked her what was going on with her computer, and after a few sentences, I reached into the drawer and found a new power cord. The computers seemed to burn through them for some reason, and I'd recently made a note to keep them in stock. I locked my computer, grabbed my coffee cup, and figured I'd stop for a fresh cup on the way to Janice's office. I stepped out into the hallway, turned left, and stopped dead in my tracks. My cup shattered on the carpeted floor, and that drew the creature's attention at the end of the hallway. It was hideous. It had a bulbous gray head that was covered in coarse black hair, and the small white eyes that dotted its head were awful looking. Its jaw lolled open to reveal a mouthful of sewing needle teeth and a flicking red tongue that constantly moved over them. It was dressed in a white button-up shirt and a pair of black slacks, but the shirt 
bulged with coarse black hair, and the pants looked to be barely containing its oddly shaped legs. It looked at me, and for a second, eyes blinked in an odd succession before it raised a hand to ask if I was okay. I shuddered and felt my knees unhinge as I slid to the wall. It sounded, it sounded like Rob. Rob's voice was coming out of this creature's mouth, and as it did, I could feel my mind slipping a little. What the hell was going on? Had I been drugged? Were they playing a trick on me? As the Rob creature made its way up the hall, I saw another thing stick its head out of the break room. It looked like an enormous bat head stuck in a business suit, and in one clawed, scaly hand, it held something that looked like Chuck's smoothie shaker. He didn't even look real. The creature looked like a photorealistic movie monster, or images from a horror site when someone has drawn creatures that just look a little too real. As the Rob creature got closer, I could see small sores on its skin, long curly hairs sprouting in places between its eyes, and I felt a scream ripping its way up my throat. The Chuck creature blinked his two big eyes at me. What's wrong? You okay? It came blundering out of the break room and towards me, and I felt my legs finally take orders as I backpedaled towards the exit door. It was 30 feet away, down several hallways, but I felt like I was motivated enough to run a mile in a minute flat. Something was wrong. Something was very wrong. And until I knew what was going on, I wasn't sure I could trust any of my senses. I had come to my office door when my back met resistance and I realized I had bumped into someone. I turned my head woodenly to see what new horror I had blundered into and I felt a fresh scream rip through me. It was a spider, a giant spider, but with a body on top of its abdomen like some fantasy creature from a video game. Its torso was vaguely feminine, breasts poking from beneath a blue cardigan that hung over its shoulders. Its eight chitinous legs clicked on the floor as it took a step backwards to assess me. It looked at me with familiarity, and I could see that it had shiny black hair piled on its head above its eight rotating eyes. Two eyes seemed to be covered by thin metal glasses, and I blundered towards my door as I realized who it was. The spider thing was Lisa. Sorry, are, are you okay? I didn't mean to. I didn't let her finish. I pushed my way into my office and slammed the door behind me. I locked the handle, pushed my chair under it, and cringed against the farthest wall I could get to. What in the hell was going on? Had, had that been real? What was I seeing out there? That couldn't be my colleagues, could it? They had sounded like them, even sort of acted like them. But the creatures out there had been so nightmarish that I couldn't even process it. All I could do was huddle under my desk, knees pulled up to my chest, and try not to cry as someone knocked on the door. You okay in there? It was Chuck. You scared Lisa half to death, man. I think she's crying in her office right now. Maybe you could come apologize? I stiffened. Lisa was crying. I, had I done that? I couldn't bear the thought that I had made Lisa cry. I had half risen from under my desk when I'd finally gotten a hold of myself again. This wasn't real. The monsters were trying to trick me so they could get me out of my office. I sat back down under my desk and squeezed my knees against my chest again. They wouldn't trick me like that. I wasn't going to be fooled so easily. Chuck banged on the door harder this time and asked what my problem was. Rob's voice made an appearance as well, and he apologized for startling me. They were worried about me and wanted me to come out so they could sort through this. They were scared for me and wanted to see me. They got angry at how I was acting and started banging louder all the while. I just huddled under my desk and sobbed quietly. I couldn't process what was going on or why this was happening, and all the avenues seemed to come back to the coffee. Someone had drugged me. Someone was messing with me. Someone had done this to make me freak out. But why? That was when the phone rang. It jangled merrily in the cradle, unaware of the horror show that was just outside the door. I looked up over the edge of my desk like a cartoon mouse peeking out of his hole. I almost expected the phone to grow fangs or sprout eyes, but it didn't. It just continued to be an average black plastic phone. I reached out shakily for it and 
as my sweaty hands settled around it. I felt it solidify and had second thoughts about my perception. My desk was still here. My computer still hummed peacefully. If this was a world for monsters, then how could all these things exist? How would a monster type with big clawed hands? How would he sit in a normal chair? How would he pick up the phone? As I picked up the phone, I heard Mr. Ryan's calm voice wash over me. It took me a minute to realize that he was calling my name as I was just sitting there in the calm warmth of my realization. <laughs> Hello, sir, I said, and my voice shook a little. Are you okay? His voice was calm and rich and made me feel like control had been restored. I... I don't know, sir. I'm, I'm seeing some weird stuff. Have you imbibed any substances today? It's okay if you have. I just want to know how we can help you. I, I just had a cup of coffee in the break room and coffee at home. I was fine when I got here, sir, and now I, I don't know what's going on. I'll be there in a few minutes. Just wait. And he hung up before I could tell him about the monsters. I hung up the phone and sat huddled under my desk. He he wouldn't be able to get here, not with the monsters out there, and even if he even if he could, would would he be normal? Maybe this was just another trick by the monsters. I sat under my desk, shuddering and waiting for the creatures to break down my door and get me. They had stopped banging and shouting, but I could still hear them scuttling around out there. They were waiting. Just waiting for me to drop my guard. Then, then they'd have me. Four loud knocks made me jump and hit my head on the desk. It's Mr. Rines. Open the door, please, so we can talk about this. I slunk from under my desk, looking for all the world like a scared rabbit as I approached the door like I thought it might explode. Are... Are the monsters gone? He didn't answer right away, probably hoping he had misheard me. Monsters? I put my mouth close to the door jam and whispered, The monsters are out in the hall. No, no monsters. Why don't you let me in so we can talk about all this and get everything straightened out? Your friends and co-workers are worried about you and are anxious to get this sorted out hand shook as I set it on the doorknob. I must have been wrong. Maybe I'd just had a psychotic incident or something. Now everything was back to normal. I had, I had acted like an ass and scared the hell out of everyone. It was time to go face the music. Maybe find out what all this was about. And as I wrapped my hand around the knob, I was sure that everything would be back to normal when I opened the door. As the door came open, the worst horror of all was waiting for me. He was a demon. His skin was the color of burnt pork and was awash with cracks and blisters that opened and oozed as he stood before me. His hands were cruel claws sprouting from the cuffs of his Armani suit and his wings extended like a miasma behind him. His face was a wide, lolling mouth, eyeless and earless, with a massive set of ram's horns that curled above the door jam as he hulked in it. When he opened his mouth, I heard the voice of Satan himself, the lilting voice that invited Eve to eat an apple, and I knew that I would never be able to deny him if he spoke. Now, let's see what all this is. I slammed the door in his face, and they've been banging at it for nearly 30 minutes. So, here I sit, writing my experience, in the hopes that someone will take something from this before they burst through the door and get me. As I write, though, a sobering feeling has occurred to me. There's a mirror in my desk. As I write this, I can't help but look at the drawer and fight the urge to pull it out. As I sit here panicked, afraid that I have somehow found myself in a world of monsters, I never stop to think that maybe the problem is me. Maybe I've lived inside a delusion my whole life. Something in that odd cup of coffee triggered me to see the world for what it really is. Could it be possible that if I were to take that mirror out and look at myself, I could see my own scales and fangs and slime as well? Could it be that somehow the veil has been pulled away and I'm finally seeing the world for what it really is? I guess the lesson here is this. 
Maybe a little soap and water is cheaper than the loss of your own sanity. Maybe I should have listened when they told me to clean my damn cup. I'm in the wind now. I'm sure I'll be dead by tomorrow, but I need to let people know this thing is loose. I'm an agent with the United States government, and my station is Black Site Number 7. I won't tell you my name, I wouldn't matter much anyway, but this was not how I saw my life going. I spent six years in Iraq, signed up right after high school. It was nothing like the recruiter told me it would be. I spent eight hours in the blistering heat. I hauled my fair share of comrades out of firefights, and I saw a lot of crap out there that would make an ordinary person go crazier than I might be. I've had a camel spider crawl on me while I sleep. I watched friends I've known since basic get decapitated through binoculars burned houses full of insurgents and civilians to rubble, and a lot of other things I, I really don't like to talk about. When I was done, they gave me my papers, thanked me for my service, and sent me home. I know I have no right to complain. Many guys didn't make it back, but home was worse. I'd spent six years in an active combat zone, and now I was just, what, supposed to come home and go back to civilian life? I spent three months in the civilian world. Two of those months were spent in crappy apartments because my parents couldn't handle the night terrors and the jumpy marine that their son had become. Every car horn, every barking dog, every firework rattling in the street had me reaching for my gun or breaking into a cold sweat when I couldn't find it. Before TJ found me, I was honestly considering killing myself. Then one day, he was just at my door with that big shit-eating grin he'd always worn in the desert. You look like hell, Hoss. Let me get you some pancakes. I got something I want to discuss with you. TJ was my platoon leader in the sandbox. They called him the comedian because he was always smiling, always cracking jokes. He was a functional sociopath. I guess most of us were. I always admired his ability to laugh in the face of the messed up stuff we did. TJ is not his real name, clearly, but since he's still in this crap and I've left it behind, I figure the best I can do is not remind them that he's why I'm here. So he took me to breakfast. In the back of a crowded Denny's, he laid it all out for me. You got it bad, Hoss, but that's okay, cause old Uncle TJ has the cure for you. Got a new job, familiar work that might interest you. Ever hear of Two Trees? As it happened, I had. Two Trees was a government institute that, on the surface, did a lot of medical research and clinical trials. Underneath, though, they did wet work, and anyone who was involved in covert ops knew about Two Trees. We'd worked with them a few times in Iraq, and their guys were spooky, to say the least. You're looking at the new head of Black Sight number seven. I furrowed my brow at him. Congrats. Should I know what that is? Of course not. It's a closely guarded government secret. Two Trees is paying me a small fortune to keep it that way. Problem is, I need someone to curate the site for me. Someone with military training, experience with firearms, and a need for some normalcy. Know anyone that might fit that bill, Hoss? I knew what he was asking, but I didn't think I was the one he was looking for. I hadn't found work in three months since I'd been back, and most of that was because I couldn't settle into anything. I was constantly jumpy, constantly on edge, and that makes it hard to find work. No one wanted you doing security work or minding a gas station when every backfiring car was an enemy combatant. What would happen if I had an episode in a government facility of all places? I shook my head. Thanks, but no thanks. I don't think I'm fit for duty the way I am. Yeah, I thought you might say that. He pulled a metal tin out of his front pocket and slid it across the table. Your medical file reads like a bench work for PTSD. Night terrors, irritability, being on edge, those irrational bouts of anger that got you thrown out of your parents' house. I felt defensive. How did you know about that? You'd be surprised what my level of clearance will get you. The therapist records were about as hard to get as a beer at a gas station. Well, I got a little present for you, Hoss. Welcome to the rest of your life, he said, tapping the outside of the silver case. The case was about as big as an Altoids tin. There were no markings on it, no filigrees or needless ornaments, and it had the distinctly surgical look that you usually see with military tech. I slid my hand towards it, but didn't seem to want to touch it. Every sense I had told me to walk away right now, not to touch that thing, and just walk away from this unassuming little case. I forced my hands to pop it open instead. Inside was a pair of gray, 
gel caps. What are these? These are the answer to your prayers. Two of these a day will make you feel as calm and clear as you did when you were a lad of 18. No more jumping at every noise. No more reaching for your gun when a dog barks or a car backfires. Just peace of mind. Looking back, that's probably what Mephistopheles said when he spoke to Faust. What's the catch? These pills are only available through the Two Trees Corporation. Employees who agree to be part of the clinical trials get them free of charge. But they're only available to employees, he said, with a little grin. Take them. Take a day to feel the effects, and let me know what you think. Call me tomorrow and give me your answer. Enjoy a night of freedom, then make your decision. I took the pills home with me, and after a few hours of staring at them, I took them with some vodka. The effects were sudden and immediate. If you've never had PTSD, then it's, it's hard to explain, but it's like having a loose wire and someone suddenly fixes it. Then you go back to the way you used to be. My anxiety just melted away. My fear dissipated. My unease and dread were gone, and my anger seemed like a distant memory. I was sitting in my crappy apartment, surrounded by the trappings of my depression and my anxiety, and suddenly, I felt like I had before I boarded that bus in 2003 and headed out to basic training. I was finally comfortable in my own head. It was like coming back to a safe place after years of running from danger. After the first good night's sleep I'd had since shipping out, I called TJ and told him I was in. One question, I asked. What's in the pills that makes them work so well? He was silent for a long minute, and then finally he said, You really don't want to know, Hoss. Pack your stuff. There will be a moving truck to take you to West Virginia in the morning. And that is how I came to work at Black Site Number 7. I must have looked like a junkie by the time I pulled up in front of my new house. I didn't have much. The truck had taken all four boxes into the deep woods as I followed in my old compact. The journey took me about 16 hours, and by the time I got there, I was starting to feel the anxiety creep back in. I became angry at how slow the truck was going, afraid that this whole thing was a trick and they would kill me. By the time I arrived, I found myself wanting to die, hoping for death, so I could return to the quiet that had been in my head before. That was when I saw TJ standing at the gate of what looked like an old military checkpoint. He flashed that knowing smile and handed me another silver case. I dry-swallowed the pills without a word and felt the inner peace worming its way back into my brain. Then, he showed me to my new quarters. It was a little bunk room with a bed, a kitchenette, and a locker for my clothes. There was a foot locker for my personal stuff, and I was told to keep the place clean. I would be responsible for the site and its security. TJ showed me a terminal off the bedroom for monitoring and camera feeds. The compound had cameras all over the place, but I appeared to be the only person here full-time. Sat's mostly for storage these days, but it's what we get up to here at night that may interest you. That's why you're here. I need someone I can trust to watch this site 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Four times a year, you'll be relieved for a week of R&R somewhere. But other than that, this is your world, Hoss. That didn't bother me. I had no problem being alone after three months of people. What I was curious about was what I would be doing out here. What am I looking at exactly? TJ pointed at the three buildings on the camera. Truck comes twice a week. Let them through the gate and don't bother them. They'll take what they need from the building and won't bother you either. Keep nosy people out. Lethal force is authorized, and don't ever go in there, or I'll have to show you where Black Side 8 is, he said with a smile. The smile didn't make it to his eyes. Don't worry about being vigilant, though. If anything bigger than a mouse moves out there, the alarms will let you know about it right away. He told me that my food would be delivered once a week, mostly MREs, and I could order anything I wanted from the terminal in the living room. There was a workout yard near the second building, and I could move through the woods if I chose, as long as I took my phone with me so I could get alerts from the console. By the way, hand me your phone, he said. When I did, he put it in his pocket and handed me a new one. That's your new phone. I'll take the keys to your car, too, and put the money in your account. This is your life now, Hoss, so don't take this job lightly. If you leave the grounds, we'll know. If you try to update social media or try to tell anyone on the outside about what you've seen here, we'll know. If you want to get married or feel like you need out, arrangements can be made after your first five-year tour. As far as anyone is concerned, you no longer exist. Don't be stupid. Put in your five years, and we'll reassess your position then. He grinned again and punched me in the arm. And lighten up. This will be the easiest five years of your life. From that point on, I was an employee of Two Trees. TJ had been right. 
the first five years flew by. I lived on the site, spending my days working out or watching TV. I played the latest video games and watched the newest movies. Twice a week, as advertised, a truck rolled up and honked. I would check the cameras, open the gates, and they would do the rest. They would honk when they were ready to leave, and I left them alone. The trucks always had the Two Trees logo on them, and they never popped in to give me any crap, and I never went out to give them any. I never tried to get into the warehouses. I'd been a soldier long enough to know how to check my curiosity, and the scares were minimal. The food kept coming, the pills kept coming, and kept me in the right mind, too, and it was pretty peaceful, all told. The alarms, to my knowledge, only went off three times in that first year. Two of those times, it was a deer who had wandered too close. The first time it happened, I had slunk out in a panic, service pistol in hand and boxer shorts flapping. As I rounded the first warehouse, I drew down on a very surprised doe who darted away before I could draw a bead on her. It was kind of a special moment for me. I had never seen a deer up close, and as it ran away, I was glad I hadn't shot it. The third time the alarm went off, it was a person, though. It was the first person I'd seen in three months. I'd been sitting at the console one night, watching the latest Marvel Avengers movie. I think it might have been Infinity Wars. When the alarm went off, I paused the movie, expecting to see a deer or a rabbit on the monitor. My eyes went wide, though, when I realized it was a person. He had a crowbar. He was attempting to pry the door open. He must have come out of the woods, because if he had driven up, I would have known about it sooner. It had been three months since I'd seen another person. The last one had been Agent Daughtry, who'd come to relieve me for a week of R&R &R in September. The idea of seeing a person not connected with two trees made me feel weird. Even when you were on R&R, &R, you went to a company resort or a company place full of company people. This stopped you from getting a little too drunk and talking about all the stuff you did for your country. It was a great idea, but it meant you had nearly no interaction with civilians. I took my pistol out and crept up on him in near silence. When my foot came down on an extra crunchy stick, he turned his head and noticed me. He raised the crowbar as if to attack, and the rest was instinct. The gun went off without me having even spoken to him, reflexes taking over and dropping the threat before it could become a real danger. His left eye popped like an overripe fruit, and he fell down on the hard December ground. I called TJ, and he and some of the other men in suits came to assess the damage. You did just right, Hoss. He was a threat to the facility and needed to be put down. Don't think for a minute that this reflects poorly on you. What will you do with him? I asked. TJ smiled. Immediate disposal, Hoss. Think you got the stomach to help us? I found that I did, and once he was doused in gasoline, we set him ablaze at the edge of the property. They gave me a week of R&R &R for that, and when I came back, TJ must have decided that I was worthy of being brought in on certain things. The alarm went off about a week after I'd come back from R&R, &R, and I saw a black car rolling up the front gate. TJ stepped out of it and waved as it stopped in the concrete roundabout other men getting out as well. I slid my shoulder holster on and went out to meet him. It was 11 p.m., and a visit this late was highly irregular. As I approached the vehicle, two guys in suits were bringing a man with a bag on his head out of the car. He was wearing scrubs, his hands bound behind his back, and I could hear him crying beneath the black hood he wore. I looked between them, waiting for an explanation, and TJ threw an arm around me and walked me towards the spot where we had burnt the trespasser. Hoss, I think it's time that we bring you in on the second reason for black sites. You see, sometimes two trees has assets that need to be eliminated. The black sites are often used for this purpose. It's always the responsibility of the site's caretaker to carry out the elimination. Fringe benefits, I suppose you could say. Why wasn't I told this before, I asked, feeling indignant. I'm no murderer. Oh, well, those combatants in Iraq will be glad to hear that, won't they? He said almost snidely. That was war, TJ. This is murder. Think of this as war too, Haas. These people are enemies, and they need to be eliminated for the good of the public safety. It's part of the job, Haas. A part I know firsthand that you're capable of. They put the man on his knees in the middle of the burn spot, and I could hear him praying under that hood as we stood around him. Put him down, Haas. That's an order, TJ said. And if I won't, I said, looking at him icily. The two men on either side drew their guns, and TJ grinned. Then I'm afraid that these men will have to execute both of you. Come on, Haas. Don't throw this away over some nobody. He's no different than the man outside the warehouse. Looking back, I kind of just wish I'd let them shoot me. But I guess if I had, you'd never know about any of this. Instead, I drew out my gun and put a bullet in his skull, glowering at TJ as his buddies put their guns away. You made the right choice, Haas. Who knows? You might not have to do this more than a dozen times in the next four years. 
On that note, he was wrong. I executed an asset a month after that. They were mostly people in scrubs, people in lab coats, doctors, researchers, people who had likely tried to steal from whatever facility they worked at. They were men, women, old men, and scared 20-somethings. I never bothered to learn their names. They were just assets that needed to be eliminated. I became kind of numb to the process. We burned them afterwards. Gasoline and fire made it like they were never there. The spot near the edge had a charred look to it for a while after that. At the end of five years, TJ came to see me and asked if I wanted to re-up. What, what happens if I walk away, I asked. I was eating dinner when he came by, and he had sat down to have a plate of fettuccine with me. Given my free time, I had learned to do a good number of things that I couldn't before. I became a pretty good cook. I learned to play the guitar, read every book on the shelf I had bought to hold them, and there was a chainsaw out back along with some sculptures I had made with it. I couldn't say I hadn't enjoyed my time here, the killings aside, but I was curious to know if they'd actually let me leave. You'll be allowed to return to the real world, your bank account fuller and your retirement substantial. Just watch what you say out there. I'd hate to have to bring you back for your replacement to put a bullet in. I ended up signing up for another four years. I shouldn't have done that. I was eight years deep when they brought the girl in the black bag to me. It was 2 a.m., and I had started to think about going to bed when the alarm went off. I saw the town car rolling up and looked for TJ. He was not the one that climbed out, however. This guy had his hair slicked back, his suit a perfect blue pinstripe. He didn't wave at me, and I felt a sense of dread as I grabbed my gun. Somehow, I expected TJ to be under that bag this time. The man's name was Stein, and luckily, he did not have TJ under that bag. What he did have was a kid with a thick black bag over their head. I couldn't tell at first if it was a boy or a girl. They were dressed in baggy clothes, Salvation Army rags that a homeless guy would be embarrassed to wear, and they were crying loudly under their hood. Two familiar men had the kid, and they both looked stoic about the whole matter. Stein didn't say anything, just led the procession over to the charred spot and put the kid on their knees. When he didn't take the hood off, I did it myself. He winced, but he didn't stop me. This was my place, my job, and I had garnered a reputation for being a professional. A reputation I was about to ruin. The bag came off, and the little girl's tear-streaked face came into view in the harsh fluorescence. Her hair was cut short, dirty blonde, and her face was covered in bruises. Her nose looked broken, her lips split. The blood trickled down her face like red tears, and they mingled with her actual tears as they fell to the damp earth. I sighed, looking at Stein as the gun stayed at the ready. The hell is this? Stein looked surprised. It's an asset. TJ said you could handle these for us. Handle the asset. This is a kid, barely old enough to wipe her own ass. What could she have possibly done? Stein's face was stony. Yours is not to question, soldier. Liquidate this asset, or be liquidated. I looked at the kid, her whole face shaking as the tears and blood fell, and I thought about watching her head pop like a grape. This wasn't some scared adult, some stoic old man, some praying woman, or some cursing thing in a sallow skin. This was a kid. I had killed a lot of people, more in my time here than I ever had during war, but I was still a professional. Professionals had standards. No, I said. Stein blinked. What? No, I don't kill kids. Do it yourself. The two men drew their guns, and I was transported back in time. I was standing there, two days after Christmas, watching TJ grin and tell me the rules. Now I was standing in the woods, the autumn leaves carpeting the ground, feeling sure that it would soon drink both my blood and the girl's. I'll give you till the count of three to kill the girl. After that point, you will both be executed. One. Their guns were unwavering, but so was my resolve. Two. I closed my eyes and prepared to die. Three. I heard a sound like wet concrete splitting open. It was followed by a high-pitched scream and a pair of bodies hitting the ground. I opened my eyes and saw Stein running towards the town car, his composure gone. The two men who'd been holding me at gunpoint were bleeding out on the ground from large, grisly neck wounds. As I watched Stein run, a rust-red something snapped out and caught him in the back of the neck, dropping him inches from the town car. The red thing protruded from the front of his neck, and he gasped futilely as he lay dying. I looked back in the direction of the thing that had snapped out and saw that the girl was now a mass of red spikes, segmented like spider legs. Her face had split down long ways, forcing her face into a grisly sideways maw. The area between the teeth glowed a deep red, 
and I could see the eyes on the girl's face blinking erratically. The two halves of her smile grinned at me, and the effect was a little dizzying. I figured for the second time that day that I was going to die, but she scuttled off into the woods instead, walking on her strange spidery appendages as she crashed through the trees. I stood there for a few minutes, not quite sure I believed I wasn't dead, and then I started running too. I crashed through the woods for hours, running in no particular direction, sure that at any minute the creature or a helicopter from two trees would fall on me and either rip me to pieces or just blow me away. I was blundering off with no wallet, no cell phone, just my gun and the clothes I'd been wearing. Was the phone how they tracked me? TJ hadn't said as much, but I kind of figured it was. When the ground went out from under me, I felt the air drop out of my lungs. I fell five feet off the muddy ledge and skinned my hands. My knees hurt where I had landed on them, and I realized pretty quick that I had fallen onto the road. If I thought it might be an illusion, the headlights that pinned me to the ground a moment later left me with little doubt. I was kind of numb to the idea of dying at this point, and I just lay there waiting to be run over. Thankfully, the truck stopped, and after a short conversation with the driver, he offered to take me into town. That's how I came to be here in this dingy hotel that just happens to have a computer in the lobby. I sold the gun for about 500 bucks, and figured I'd disappear as soon as I'm done writing this. They know I'm gone now, but I don't know if they think I'm dead or if they think I ran. Either way, they'll find me. I'm pretty sure of it. I'm more worried about the little girl that's loose in the woods, and whatever it is that's living beneath their skin. If you see a young girl with short, dirty blonde hair, do not approach her. I don't know if she killed those men to get away, or if she killed them because she wanted to, but she should be considered dangerous if you encounter her in the wild. And if a man from Two Trees offers you a job, do not become the new curator of Black Side 7. The job is definitely not at all what it appears to be. We recently moved into our new house. It's perfect, just the right size for our family, but it has a strange problem with the drains. I noticed it while I was unpacking the bathroom things. I turned to discover that my husband hadn't flushed and pushed the lever to send it down the drain. When I did, I discovered that the sinks burble whenever you flush the toilet. Nothing too jarring, but it scared me a little when I first heard it. The sink burbled and bubbled, making a noise deep in the drain as it cleared the water. My husband laughed it off when I mentioned it to him. It's an old house, dear. The pipes are on the central line that feeds into the septic tank. No one has used them in a while, so it's probably just getting used to people being here again. I blew it off as a weird thing the house did and just went about my business. A week later, the drain started burbling when I took a shower, too. I overlooked it, though, not wanting to dwell on something I ultimately couldn't do anything about. This was the first place I'd lived with a septic tank. I'd always used city water, and I figured it was just something that happened when you used a septic tank. My husband barely seemed to notice it, so I assumed it was nothing out of the ordinary. After a few weeks, I had almost come to ignore it, until the whispering started. I was brushing my teeth one night, running the water as I always did, when I heard the burbling coming from the drain again. I had bent my mouth to the stream to get a mouthful of water, when I could have sworn I heard a burbling kind of whisper coming from the drain. It was barely audible, more like a gurgle than a burble, but as I listened, it almost sounded like words. Black bank bees. Beck bank bees. I turned off the water, spitting my mouth full of paste down the drain, and closed the door behind me. The burbling got worse from there on out. It didn't just bubble when the water was on. It always bubbled, loud and jarring, and I was still certain I could hear some kind of whispering. My husband just shrugged it off as normal. He was busy with work and didn't have time to indulge his flighty wife. I put up with it as best I could, but it was honestly starting to grate on my nerves a bit. I heard it in the kitchen, the living room, and especially whenever I had to go to the bathroom. The bathroom seemed to be the epicenter, and as the days progressed, I became more and more confident I could hear words amidst the gurgles. I lost my cool one night when my husband was working late. As I lay in bed, my son sleeping soundly next to me, I could hear the sink burbling and whispering from the hall bathroom. The bubbles were visible now when it burbled, deep green bubbles that sloshed up the drain and filled the sink with a stagnant water smell. Never when my husband was at home, of course, and the bastard didn't believe me when I showed him the thin film that hung on the bowl. As I lay there listening, the gurgling seemed to mock me. It seemed like only I could hear it, and the continued surge of tidal force had frazzled me. 
I was up before I knew what I was doing. I stomped down the hall in my pajamas, heading for the bathroom on bare feet. I was mad. I'd had enough of it, and I slammed the door open as I saw the towel rack shake ominously. I flipped on the lights like I was intending to catch the sink doing something wrong and shouted loud enough to make my son stir and cry in his sleep. Shut up! Shut up right now! I screamed at the burbling sink. And for a wonder, it did. The drain stopped burbling for a few seconds and there was peace. Then a geyser erupted from the drain and splashed high enough to splatter the ceiling in a green fountain. It splattered the walls, pattered against the shower curtain, and caused the ceiling to rain drops of thick sludge. I'd fall into my backside in the hallway, watching the geyser with wide eyes, when I saw something gloop out of the drain that made me scream. I scuttled across the floor, my back hitting the bedroom door, hearing my son cry out from the bedroom. I had seen the last thing I would have expected from the narrow bathroom drain, and I was certain now that I could hear something else joining it as it gurgled onto the bathroom floor. A hand. A hand of sludgy, green liquid that had pushed its way up the drain like an angry hurricane. I reached with numb fingers for the knob, the fingers refusing to find purchase as I slapped at it uneasily. I heard a gurgling thunk then, the sound of water trying to maintain a shape it was unaccustomed to, and something cast a shadow against the door. The best way I can describe it is... The shadow appeared to be cast by a living jello mold. It was solid, but not transparent. It cast a watery shadow, its form undulating as it came towards the door. A single green watery hand gripped the door frame. I screamed as it lumbered into the hallway, and my grasping hand felt like a dead fish. It was six feet tall, bulbous and amorphous, with a shuddering bald head. Its eyes were murky green coals, and its form was a wiggling mass of barely contained fluid. The fluid was... well, it was awful. It had clearly drawn its matter from the septic tank, and the things floating within the water didn't bear thinking about. It took a single unsure step, the unstable golem shaking as it took another tottering step forward. My son was screaming now, unsure where I was, and his terror only amplified my fear. As it wobbled towards me, leaving puddles of oozing liquid on the floor, I heard the burbling voice again as it whisper-wailed its words. Beck, bank, bees. Beck, bank, bees. I tried again to open the door, my eyes locked in terror on this watery monstrosity. Beck, bank, bees, beck, bank, bees. I felt my own water puddle on the floor as my bladder let go, the creature towering over me. Beck, bank, bees, it yelled. It leaned over me, and I could feel the stagnant drops fall onto my face. I wanted to cover my nose. It smelled like raw sewage, but I was too afraid to move. I was sure in that moment that I would never see my husband or my son again. He would return home to find me dead, maybe find our son dead too in his bed. He would see the water and always wonder what had happened to me. As this creature crouched over me, I was certain that the last thing I saw would be his terrible sewage form. It bent its watery lips to my face then, and when it whispered this time, I could hear something different. Check. Tank. Please. The words were spoken as though they might break the creature, and they were spoken with the utmost emphasis. His speech was slushy, slurry, as though his tongue was missing. He was approximating speech, but it was still difficult to make out. I looked into those green orbs and repeated back what he had said. Ch check, tank, please? It nodded its liquid head, its featureless face almost looking relieved. Then it melted into a deluge of stagnant water, and I was covered in buckets of disgusting sewage. My husband didn't believe me. I was still cleaning up sewage when he came home, and he was utterly flabbergasted. I told him about the creature, about its final message, but he refused to believe it. It was a dream, he said. The septic tank had backflowed into the house, and I had dreamed this watery creature. We went back and forth for hours, until finally I had the solution. Open up the septic tank, then. If there's nothing there, then I'll never say another word about it. I'll deal with the gurgles and the bubbles, and I'll never say another word about anything. 
After another hour of arguing, he finally relented. We called a service, and they breached the lid. It wasn't too hard. The earth was removed, and the lid was removed with a little backhoe. The smell was atrocious, but the men didn't seem to mind. My husband told them that we had a problem with the tank. It flowed into the house, and they figured the valve had been stuck. I saw the pumper hose descend, and the tank was emptied. My husband said I didn't need to be there for this, but I wanted to see. As the sewage went down, I saw the operator's eyes grow large. He called his partner over, and a flashlight was found. The flashlight nearly fell into the tank when it fell across the sewage-covered lump. His partner told us that it appeared to be something in the tank, but we shouldn't worry. The house has been empty for a while. It's probably just a congealed mass or something. The operator continued to pump the tank, and as the water level fell, we saw that the lump was more than a congealed mass of waste. It was a body. The police were called. Our front yard was soon playing host to three squad cars, a fire truck, and an ambulance. The techs were shunted aside as the rescue team received the body from the septic tank and loaded the remains into a body bag for identification. The police asked us some questions, but had already cleared us for the most part, since the body appeared to have been there for months. The inspector had likely not breached the tank at all during the initial inspection, so the body could have been there for years if it had been sealed properly. As the bag was zipped, I got a momentary glance at him. It was large, the head bald and lumpy. It looked a little like the sewage form that had tottered over me in the hallway. Before they zipped it up, the desiccated creature's mouth lulled open, and I felt a chill run down my spine. His tongue was mangled. Since the incident, we've heard no more burbling. The septic tank hasn't sputtered, and the house has been quiet since that night. Other than the sounds of our family, of course. My husband still can't explain how I knew there was a body in the tank, but I'm just glad that there was ultimately a happy ending to the story. So next time you hear a burbling in your pipes, don't discount it as simple plumbing issues. Your house may be hearing burbles from beyond. It began as a freak snowstorm. I've been hiking and camping in the woods outside of Kashmir since I was in high school. It was a spot I used to like to come to with my friends, before they all got too busy to return to nature every now and again. The wilderness in North Georgia is just so beautiful. It's a great place to immerse yourself in nature and return to your roots. This weekend, however, I found myself at nature's mercy instead of its beauty. Well, maybe not nature. The longer I stay here, the more I suspect that something insidious might be in this place. When I set up my tent Friday afternoon, the temperature had been a little crisp, but nothing out of the ordinary. Spring has been in bloom, and it seemed unthinkable that it could get below 50 in the daytime. I had been meaning to hike deeper, coming back out again on Sunday, but when I woke up to find snow... I decided my weekend might be a bust. After gathering the gear I could find, I began hiking back to my truck. But I must have gotten turned around. As the day fretted out, I realized how lost I'd become. My usual landmarks were either covered in snow or changed so drastically that I didn't even recognize them. My compass was no help. The needle kept turning and turning, leading me in circles as I wandered through the snow. As I got more and more turned around, the night began to creep up on me. I was soon watching the sunset as I thought about whether or not to put up my tent or keep walking. And that was when I saw the light. It was small, like a candle on a windowsill. I'd never seen any houses out in the woods before, but it was possible that someone had built one in the six or eight months since I'd last been out here. I began heading in that direction, and as I did, I saw a cabin begin to materialize amidst the snow. A candle was burning on the windowsill, and as I approached, I began to look for signs of life. I saw no four-wheelers or any means of getting in and out. I was making sure to make a little noise, whistling and crunching loudly through the snow so as not to startle someone who might not want company. The cabin was not the sort of pre-made ones you sometimes saw in showrooms. It looked to have been made of sturdy trees, and the wood looked new and raw. Someone had built this recently, and it made me even more aware of whoever was inside. It was 
pretty likely that a gun lived there as well, and I was in no hurry to be a squib in the local paper. As I knocked on the door, I felt a little like Goldilocks trying to introduce myself to the three bears. I don't know what possessed me, but when no one answered, I tried the knob. It opened easily, and the door wasn't locked. So I stepped out of the snow to find a roaring fire in the grate of the one-bedroom cabin. It was humble. A bed, a table, a large bookshelf that seemed to stretch the length of one wall, some chairs, and the fireplace. It was so warm after having come out of the cold that I couldn't help myself. I stepped inside and made a beeline for the fireplace. I was careful not to track snow in, leaving my boots and pack on the front porch in the hopes that whoever lived there would recognize that I was here and not be startled. I don't know where the owner of the cabin was, but if they were out hunting in this weather, I wasn't likely to receive a warm welcome. Either way, I didn't think I had any options with the snow falling and the night fast approaching. I sat by the fire, and as the flames dried my clothes, I couldn't help but look at the huge bookshelf that stretched across the wall. It was floor to ceiling, and as big as it was, there was still space for more books. The books were numerous, about thirty in all, and their spines had the names of people instead of titles. My curiosity got the better of me, and I went and took the first one down. The name, Jeremy Blake, was printed in gold leaf on the spine, and when I opened it, it cracked in that satisfying way that old books do. The owner of the home probably wouldn't appreciate me perusing their bookshelf, but I figured I already had enough to apologize for. What was one more thing, right? The inside was written in what appeared to be real ink, and the handwriting was delicate and practiced. Whoever Jeremy Blake had been, he'd been a very dab hand when it came to writing. I had assumed it was biographical, but the book didn't look old enough to have been written in 1736, as it claimed on the front cover. Jeremy talked about being out hunting deer with his brothers when they were suddenly set upon by a snowstorm. It had been snowing when they set out, but they now found themselves in a real blizzard. His brothers had left him when he couldn't keep up, and Jeremy thought he was about to die. That's when he saw the light out in the woods. He talked about coming upon the cabin, and how it had seemed so empty, but lived in. Like me, he had decided to thank the owner when he returned, and set about pinning this in his journal which he'd brought with him. I pray the snow passes quickly. I would love nothing more than to return to my father's home so that I might chastise my brothers for leaving me in such a sorry state. The next entry, though, was a little bit different. Jeremy had woken up to find that no one had returned to the cabin and the snow was still falling outside. He had thought it looked a little better, and now that he was warm, he thought he might try to make his way home again. Jeremy opened the door to leave, but upon stepping out, he'd walked right back into the cabin instead. He tried this several more times, but always found himself stepping back into the warm, inviting cabin. There was only one door. When he tried to break a window in his fervor, he found they would not break. He became a little bit upset, fearing that he had stumbled into some kind of deviltry. He tried to leap through the window and nearly knocked himself unconscious. He had destroyed the house, flipped over tables and thrown chairs, but none of them had broken. When he turned around, it had all resumed its previous position, and Jeremy was certain that he had found some sort of witch's den and was most afraid. The next few days were full of entries about Jeremy continuing to live inside the cabin and discovering what it was all about. He found that he didn't need to eat or drink, which was both a blessing and a curse. Despite not needing these things, he found that he was always hungry and constantly licking his lips when his mouth felt dry. He watched from the window as the snow began to melt, and as winter became spring, he watched the animals roam outside the cabin. After a while, his entries became a journal of what he'd seen from the cabin's windows, until I discovered the last entry in this long series of observations. I don't know if anyone will ever read this. I suppose it matters not. I've existed in this house for a long, long time. I cannot say how long, but 
I was not even fifteen when I came in out of the cold. And now, when I look at the glass over the fire, I see an old man staring back at me. I don't know how much longer I'll survive, but today I saw another person for the first time in a long time. I was looking out the window, watching the snow fall again, when a child came hesitantly from the tree line. He was looking at the small candle that had brought me here, but his eyes got big when he saw me looking back at him. He took a step towards the house, meaning to come inside or ask who I was, but I shooed him away. I think now that I should have let him open the door to see if I could escape, but I couldn't take the chance of that boy being stuck here as well. Better to die alone here than have some young fellow watch me pass. He scampered away when I banged on the glass and yelled at him, probably for the best. I'm going to stop now. This journal does nothing but remind me that I'm alive. Maybe it would be better to be dead. I wasn't sure what to make of the journal. Was it real, or some make-believe story the owner had concocted? I looked at the bookcase and wondered if they were all like that. It was getting dark outside, so I took the second journal over to the fireplace so I could read it in the roaring light of the fire. The pine knot cracked as I got comfortable, and the whole experience was very rustic. The handwriting was a little rougher, not the same as the beautiful script of the previous one. Inside were the musings of a woodcutter. His writing was shorter, more surface level. He'd gotten lost while chopping wood and found the cabin on his way home. He stopped in to see who lived there and got himself trapped inside, just like the writer before him. He'd used his axe to try to break free, but to no avail. He'd taken up the book he found on the shelf and began writing to pass the time. Wasn't much, three or four pages before he stopped. He wrote about watching some squirrels, seeing a deer, and worrying that he would starve when he didn't find any food in the cabin. Whether he died or became bored, I don't know. He stopped writing about five pages in, signing Roland Wood at the bottom. The same name on the book spine, written in the same rough gold leaf that the words were written in. The next diary turned out to be a kind of fantasy story. Something my grandpa would have called an oat opera. It talked about pioneers on the trail, one of them breaking off in the night to have a call of nature. He finds a strange cabin with a flickering candle, and once he went in, it refused to turn him loose. He spent a few pages talking about being trapped in the cabin, and when his sister came to look for him, he saw her and banged on the window to get her attention. She looked up, clearly startled, and ran away before she could help him. Whether she'd seen him or not, no one ever came to look for him. The rest of the journal was spent telling the story of the pioneers and what they must have seen on the trail. His sister seemed to be the main character, and he talked about the Indians they fought, the animals they hunted, and the things they survived on the way to their new home. Eventually she married a man, and the two lived on the prairie with their growing family on the outskirts of Preacher's Glen. Towards the end, he must have become a little jaded with the whole thing, and the story took a dark turn. His sister, her husband, and her children became riddled with hardships as the Indians descended upon their house, burning their crops and killing them all. The sister watched her family suffer for the crime of leaving her brother behind. The journal ended with her finally being allowed to die at the hands of her captors. He signed it William T. Pitt on the last page, and when I looked up from the story, I realized it was day again. As snow rattled loudly against the window, I had to wonder if it had only been a day. Jeremy's journal made it clear that the concept of time was a little wobbly. Had I been here a day? A week? A year? The snow was still blowing outside, but it didn't have to be the same storm that had brought me here. I looked at the door as I got up to put the book away and wondered if I would find myself stepping right back into the cabin. I took a step towards the door, but I wasn't bold enough to try it yet. I needed more research first. With little else to do, I picked up the fourth journal. I noticed that William Pitt was on the spine of the third one as I put it back, 
and Beverly Stryker was on the spine of the one I took down. It seemed that the cabin had finally attracted a female resident, and I was interested in getting her point of view on the whole situation. Beverly's story was a little different from the others. Miss Stryker was in trouble when she found the cabin. Beverly had been fleeing into the night to escape her abusive husband. She hadn't wanted to marry him. He was not the sort of man that women like to marry, but she had made the mistake of falling for him when she was young, not realizing what a brood he was until it was too late. By then, her father had decided that if his youngest daughter wanted to marry someone so far below her station, then he would let her. He had enough useless mouths to feed, useless mouths in need of dowries, and her husband had asked relatively little from him by way of a dowry. The two had been wed less than a year when Beverly had run away for the first time. He had found her easily enough. Her husband was a hunter, and her trail had been easy to follow. He had his farmhands tie her up in the barn and whipped her with a horse whip he used on the colts when they were breaking them in. Her skin had been covered in welts, broken and red from the lashing, and Beverly had been left in the barn overnight to think about what she'd done. She thought all right, but it wasn't likely the reflection her husband had been thinking of. Beverly lay in the filthy hay all night, thinking about her current situation and planning her next escape attempt. She played the dutiful wife for the next three months, filling his cup, cooking his dinner, and keeping his house like he liked, until her husband grew lazy again. He stopped having the hands watch her so closely. He stopped locking the bolts every night so she couldn't escape. He stopped putting the dogs out every night so they would alert him when she left. Then one night, she ran, but not fast enough. He was after her sooner than she expected, and she had heard the bang of the dogs and the clump, clump, clump of the horse's hooves. She was running through the woods, the early autumn chill sending goosebumps up her skin. She hadn't gotten dressed in anything heavier than a shift. If he'd caught her getting dressed, he'd have known she meant to run. So now she ran in the light of the late year moon, her body bathed in the golden light as she fled for her life. When she had fallen, she had expected to be ridden down out of hand, but the hooves and the dogs went past her as she lay, curled in the boughs beneath a tree. The roots made a kind of cage, Beverly looking through the bars as she listened to insects and night birds singing their song. She expected to be found, expected to be caught, but as the night deepened, she found it was only her out in the wilderness. The dancing light had stolen her from her worries, and that was when she noticed the candle. Beverly found the cabin and had been trapped by the enticing cage. There wasn't much after that. She'd written a little more, but nothing as exciting as the night run through the forest. She read the journals and discovered that she couldn't leave, but there was none of the fear or uncertainty the others had shown. She was content in this place, a place her husband couldn't find. She lived inside the cabin, updating the journal sparingly and passing away with nothing to show for it and no one the wiser. I looked at the door again, but the next book looked so inviting. Books became my food. I devoured them, reading some of them and taking their stories in. The cabin had attracted many in its lifetime, and I wondered how many more had chosen not to write. How many had suffered in silence here? How many had simply wasted away with nothing to mark their passing, except their memories? Those who had written had left behind everything, from pages and pages of observation to short little stories about nothing at all. They wrote fantasies, westerns, slice-of-life stories about the people they'd left behind, and it all became more and more modern as time went on. I don't know how long I sat there reading, but... It was snowing again when I looked up to find a journal in my hand with my own name on it. I opened it and found the pages as white and blank as the landscape outside my window. The doorknob was cold when I wrapped my hand around it. The wind was cold as it blew snow in through the open door. My boots were still on the porch, but they looked old and weather-beaten. The backpack was gone likely dragged off by some animal while I was reading. The boots had been tan when I bought them less than a year before I entered the cabin. Now they look bleached, the fabric thin as a mummy's cheek. 
I wanted to reach out and touch them, to see if my fingers would go through the thin skin of the boots, but I knew I would never get close to them. I stepped out onto the porch and found my foot coming down on the hardwood floor of the cabin. I closed the door and went back to the fire, picking up the journal with my name on it. If you're reading this, then it's already too late. I don't know if this place is supernatural or just some old pocket out of time, but I do know that it's a trap. I don't know if there's any escape from this place, but I know that no one's coming to look for me. I hope my diary is the last, but I have no doubt there will be others. The house seems to draw us to it, collecting stories as it collects lives. At least, I'll be warm before I die. I looked down at what I'd written, unsure of what else to say. It was barely a page, and the effort seemed lame. I was no writer. I had never done more than emails or text messages. But as I struggled to find something to add to it, the futility of the exercise hit me all at once. If someone read it, they would be trapped anyway. My warning wouldn't help them, and my eyes slipped over to the fire as I thought about just burning it. Would it burn? I didn't know, but if the cabin wanted lives, then why give it what it wanted? Then I turned back to the door and thought of something a little different. An experiment might bear results. The book thumped onto the porch when I tossed it, and when I turned back to the bookshelf, it hadn't returned to its spot. The snow skittered across the pages, leaving wet runners on the paper as they marked them. They fluttered back and forth as the wind hit them, but the book was a little too heavy to be pushed by the wind. The snow seemed loath to come up on the porch, so I didn't think it would ruin it. When I closed the door, I hoped that someone would see it before they opened it. I had added a little bit at the end, and as I sat shivering by the fire, I hoped they would notice the book and follow the instructions before barging in. Knock three times and open the door. Under no circumstances come in. If the house is empty, run away as fast as you can. If I'm here, hopefully you can help me escape.